All right, hello everybody. We're gonna talk about um, using chi-square analysis with our Hardy-Weinberg problems. And let me start off right off the bat by saying, if you have not mastered how to use the Hardy-Weinberg equation, you need to get that down first because none of this is gonna make any sense. Oops, and I see that I have scribbles on this. I'm gonna erase that while I'm talking. Um, so let me just remind you of a few quick things. I don't think this um, video will take very long. Remember that when we're measuring frequencies and they've got this bolded at the top here, um, it's always gonna be between zero and one. Um, so frequency is usually going to be a decimal unless there are zero of them or unless it's 100%. If it's 100%, it's going to be one. If frequencies freak you out, um, then think of it as percentages. If you multiply it by 100, you've got the percent. So if the frequency is 0.48, then that means that 48% of the organisms have that trait or whatever it is that you're researching. All right. And then just to be clear, this is the um, what I'm looking at are the optional problems. Um, so I just thought I'd talk you through the reading so that you could hear it instead of having to read it all by yourselves. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started. It says, um, question 1A, in a certain population of newts, newts are really cool, like brightly colored salamander dudes, they're really neat, um, and they tend to be poisonous. So... Um, being poisonous in this example is dominant over not being poisonous. And you count 200 newts and eight of them are not poisonous. Whoops. So that eight of them that are not poisonous, that means those are the homozygous recessives. That's the only way that they could be not poisonous. Um, so it says, what are the allele frequencies of the parent population? So when they say allele frequency, they are asking you for P and Q, not P squared, not 2PQ, not Q squared, just how common are the, um, the different alleles in this population. So we're going to have to solve for Q because you always solve for Q. You never solve for P first. So we have eight that are homozygous recessive out of 200. So we write that and it's all explained right here um, in the reading. Eight out of 200, that is your Q squared. Those are your Q squared. We wanna solve for Q. So to get rid of the squared, we do the opposite um, mathematical computation. Gosh, I'm drawing a blank on what that's called. Anyway, um, and they cancel each other out. So by taking the square root of Q squared, we have function. That's what I was looking for. We have Q standing by itself. If we take the square root on the right side, then we need to take the square root on the left side. So 8 divided by 200, it says it right here, is 0.04. And then when we take the square root of it, it's 0.04. Two. So right now we just solved Q is 0.2. And what that means, remember that P plus Q equals 1. So we need to calculate P. So 1 minus 0.2. P is 0.8. So we have just answered question 1C. What are the allele frequencies? 20% of the newts are going to have a recessive trait and 80% of the newts, or I'm sorry, I didn't say that right. 20% of the traits total are, or the alleles total are um, the recessive and 80% of the alleles total. Remember each, buddy, each um, animal gets two of these alleles. 80% of them are the dominant trait. All right, um, so now moving on, it says, whoops, I'm trying to get this to move forward. There we go. Question 1B, 50 newts are washed downstream after a big storm and colonize a new pond. <gasps> That's important because they're describing genetic drift when um, a bunch of organisms, if they all die, then that would be the bottleneck effect. But if they start a new colony, then that's the founder effect. Definitely, they're related concepts. Um, but basically, we've made this population be, it started out this big, and now the population is this big. Okay, so it says, what do you expect the frequency and number of each genotype to be? And the word expect is super important. If you remember, and it's mentioned down here, if you remember from chi-squared problems, we have O for observed, so what you see in the actual population, and then we have E for your expected. So what did you think the population was supposed to be according to statistics? Then you subtract them, you do some fancy math, you determine your chi-square value and you determine whether it's significantly different. If they, if the observed and the expected aren't exactly the same, is it a meaningful difference or is it, you know, a negligible difference? Can we ignore the difference? And that's what we're going to be looking at here. Okay, so let's go back to the question. It says, 50 newts are washed downstream, colonize a new pond. What do you expect the frequency and number of each genotype to be? So it says you would expect the allele frequencies to remain the same. That's the expected. Now, you and I probably know that if 50 wash down the stream, they're giving this 
us this problem for a reason. It's probably not as expected, but we're going to stick with the, the 0.2 for Q and the 0.8 for P. That would be the expected. That's the null hypothesis, and that's what it would be, listen carefully, that's what it would be if this population was in, this new population was in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. If nothing is changing, if everything's the same, that is, Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium is our null hypothesis. So now if we get a big chi-square value, we're going to reject the null hypothesis. If we get a really small chi-square value, then we'll say, okay, yeah, the difference was negligible and we're there in fact in equilibrium. They are not evolving right now. So it says to find the genotype frequencies, fill in the Hardy-Weinberg equation. So um, you take, um, so we're just doing, we're calculating P squared, 2PQ, and Q squared, and that's what they're showing you here. So P squared, remember those are the homozygous dominant. So we said our P was 0.8, so we square it and we find 0.64. So 64% of the population we are expecting would be homozygous dominant. We are expecting 2PQ for the heterozygotes, so that would be 32% of the population. And then of the homozygous respect, homozygous respect, Recessives, whoo, having trouble talking. We would expect 4% of the population. Those are our expected. All right, now we need to convert those into actual numbers, not just percents or frequencies. So to do that, you multiply these frequencies, these decimals, by the total number of the population. In this case, the population had 50 in it. 50 were what washed down the stream and started this new population. So we do 50 times 64, we do 50 times 32, and we do 50 times 0.04. And that tells us exactly how many individuals we expect. So that's what we're going to be putting in the expected column in our um, chi-squared um, in our chi-squared table. Oh, I don't have a good word for it. All right. So those are our expected. Question 1C says, you count the new population of 50 individuals. You find 21 homozygous poisonous. Let's bring this back up so you can compare them. There we go. Here's our numbers that we're expecting. You expect 21 homozygous poisonous, but you predicted 32. Now, is that a significant difference or not? Well, to prove whether it's significant at the 95% or higher level, um, we're going to use a chi-square test for that. Okay, and 23 are heterozygotes, you predicted 16, and 6 are homozygous recessive, and you predicted 2. So it says, is this what you expect? Test using chi-square. If it is not, what are the new allele frequencies? All right, so we've got our observed. I don't want to raise it too much here. Maybe I'll put me over here. Um, we've got our observes right here. That's what you saw in the actual population. Now we need our expecteds. Now, down below, I'll just show you that they, sh they have a column for frequency. You don't need that column, but if you want that column, that's fine. So you could ignore that. The frequency is just these 0 0.64, 0 0.32, and 0.04s that we calculated, the P squared, the 2PQ, and the Q squared. If you want to include them, that's fine, but you don't need to. So we calculated already the expected 32, 16, and behind my picture is 2. So this is 32, 16, and 2. And now we do a regular chi-square problem, which some of you might be rusty at, and you really know how to need to know how to do these. <coughs> there will be one on your FRQ this time, and there for sure will be one on your um, AP biology exam in May. All right. So zero, or I'm sorry, observed minus expected. So you've got 21 minus 32. So that's a negative 11. Now you square it negative 11 squared. And remember, whenever you square a negative number, it's always positive. So over in this column over here, you're never going to have a negative number. Actually, you'll never have a negative number here if you multiply it out. I haven't multiplied it out yet. I'm not going to do all the math here. That seems like a waste of our time because they did it right here, I believe. There we go. So down here, um, we see they're expected, the O minus E. Now they squared it, and now they divided by E, which I... <laughs> had not done yet. So we come up with an answer of 14.8. That is our chi-squared value. That is our chi-squared value, which is a pretty high value, but we need to take a look at our degrees of freedom. This is where it's going to get a little bit annoyingly tricky. Oh, I have to switch pages and I don't know how to change pages. How do I switch pages? I know how. There we go. Okay, so this does get a little bit um, annoying. 
is it going to show us here? I can't remember. Yes. So it says you have two alleles. You had the dominant and the recessive. So they count that as two categories, even though we had homozygous dominant, heterozygous, and homozygous recessive. We're still saying you have a P and a Q. So your degrees of freedom is one less than that. So two minus one. Remember, you always subtract one from your um from your categories. So two minus one. So your degrees of freedom is just one. Now we need to talk a bunch about that because it gets confusing. Um, number one, for the most part on AP bio tests, if you say you have um, however many alleles there are, usually it's going to be two and you subtract one, you're going to be fine. It gets a little complicated with co-dominant and incomplete dominant um, um phenotypes, because in that case, there are three different possible phenotypes. Do you guys remember, I'm going to just draw this out really quickly, that you could have with co-dominant, you could have big R, big R, big R, big W, and big W, big W, and that's red and pink and white, for example. That's three different phenotypes, and so the temptation would be to do three minus one and get two degrees of freedom. It's a little bit subtle, and what I've researched this up the wazoo to see how the college board wants us to do it. And for the most part, you don't need to worry about it. So if you say there are two alleles, red and white, and you subtract one and get one, you will be great. Um, there's a little bit of subtlety to it that has to do with statistics that is, is beyond the scope of AP biology, and we're not going to go into it. So don't worry about it. Just if you have two alleles, you subtract one and you have one degree of freedom. If you had three alleles, blood types have three alleles, A, B, and O. So then you would do three minus one in that circumstance and you would have two degrees of freedom. Okay, so just don't worry about it. What I'm told actually is that on the AP bio exam, if they want you to calculate degrees of freedom and then determine whether the chi-square value, if you accept or reject, they would make the chi-square value bigger than both one degree of freedom and two degrees of freedom. So if you flubbed up the degree of freedom just a little bit, there's some wiggle room. That's what I'm told. So don't worry about it. All right, so let's move on. So it says here, um, you're calculated. Um, so you're, the table, sorry, it's down below. I'll show you it right here. This is our chi-squared value at one degree of freedom. The chi-squared value, the critical value is what they call that. Um, the critical value is 3.841. And remember that our chi-squared value was 14 something. So it's way higher than this value. So does that mean you accept or reject the null hypothesis? So let's think about what that all meant. Remember the null hypothesis when it comes to evolution problems, the null hypothesis is Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. Nothing's happening, nothing's changing. So that would be everything below a 3.84 critical value. If it's above 3.84, then we say, hey, something is going on. This population is evolving. Their, their allele frequencies are changing. That's what evolution is. The frequency of the different genes is changing. And that would be um, then the, the statistical evidence of evolution happening. So in our example, with a chi-square value of 14, we would reject the null hypothesis and we would say evolution is occurring. All right, everybody, I recommend that you try these practice problems. Um, there's one required problem that's with the capybaras. Um, but other than that, these are practice. This is absolutely on your FRQ. So make sure you feel good about it and let me know if you have any questions. Have a great rest of your day.